Hello again and welcome to session six of UGBS 204, Macroeconomics and Business. Today we are going to talk mainly about money and the banking system. So today is going to be an introduction to the concept of money and then in the subsequent sessions we'll talk about monetary policy. And uh, so in this session, we start explaining the meaning and the functions of money and then give an overview of the financial system and then introduce the concept of fractional reserve banking. Towards the end, we start talking about the money market. That is the money demand and then money supply. Now, in terms of objectives for this session, by the end of this session, it's expected that students can explain the meaning and the functions of money be able to explain the structure of the financial system and the role that financial institutions and financial markets play, be able to explain the concept of the demand for money and the main determinants of demand for money, then be able to identify the measures of monetary aggregates, that is aggregate money supply, and also demonstrate an understanding of money market, that is how interest rates are determined. So reading list, so chapter seven of the main textbook, textbook by Abel Bernanke and Crochet is a very good reading, but uh, any of the other readings are also very good substitute. Now, there are additional special readings for this session. And you see the quarterly bulletin of the Bank of Ghana. So the link has been provided. In particular, you have, if you go to the website of the Bank of Ghana, you look for the quarterly bulletins, and then you download the second quarter, the quarterly bulletin for the second quarter of 2015, pages 17 to 32. We will make reference to that in this session. So let's start off with the meaning of money. Now, in the absence of money, so consider an economy where we don't have money. How would people buy goods and services? Well, if there was no money, the only way we can, you can buy something is to offer what you have. And that is what we call a barter system. A barter system is what used to be before money, if money came. So under barter, people exchange goods for goods and services for services and goods for services and so on and so forth. Now, the main problem with barter, barter has several problems, but the main problem is that before you could exchange goods and services, it has to be the case that it satisfies a condition we call double coincidence of want. One of the things that made butter inefficient is the need for double coincidence of want. That means that before you and I can trade, it has to be the case that you want what I have to give and I want what you have to give. So you must have what I want and want what I have to trade. That's the only way we can trade. And you can imagine that that's going to be a very difficult system. So you have to go around looking for somebody who has what you are looking for and want what you have to offer. And that is what you call double coincidence of want. So that was a pretty inefficient system and that led to the evolution of money. So what is money? Well, money is anything that people as generally accept in exchange for goods and services. That is, anything that acts as a medium of exchange is money. So you notice that throughout history, different things have been used as money. The key thing is that people are generally happy to accept it, in the knowledge that when they exchange it for something else, others will also accept it. So anything that performs this function, that is, acts as an effective medium of exchange, is money. So before the paper money that we are used to currently, we, people used to use things like cigarette, ivory, gold, copper, curry, and so many different items as money. So we, we call those commodity money. When we use items or commodity stuff as money, instead of the paper money that we are used to, we call them commodity money. Now, the main problem why we moved away from commodity money was that first, because those were commodities, we could run out of supply. For instance, if you use, say, diamond as money, 
if what will happen if the world ran out of the stock of diamond? It means that we cannot generate new money. So that was one problem. The other problem is that the other problem was that because the commodities themselves had intrinsic value, it meant that the, the, their, their price could go up. That had nothing to do with their monetary use. So that was also another problem. That led to the evolution of paper money. Now, the paper money, the current paper money that we use, we also call it fiat money. That is it's money by fiat. That is, it is declared legal tender by law. So if you take any CD note that you have with you right now and you take a look, you realize that somewhere on the front space it says that this is declared legal tender for the payment of any amount. That means that it's money because the government says so. It's money because the law says so. Now, the reason why if you and I print or if you and I cut a similar size paper and try to use it to buy things, nobody will accept it because it doesn't have that legal authority that says that this is legal tender. So that is what we call fiat. It's money by fiat. Now, money performs three main functions. We've already indicated that the most important function of money is what defines money. And that is that it should serve as a medium of exchange. People should be happy to exchange whatever they have for money. But that's not the only function of money. Money also serves as a unit of account. That is, it allows us to put value on different things and be able to compare. So if you, couldn't have, if you didn't have money, it would be difficult for us to compare uh, one cow and one house. Okay, but once we have monetary value, we can put, we can convert each of them to the monetary value, and then we can compare them. So in that case, we say that money is serving as a unit of account. Also, money is a store of value. So money allows us to store perishable items and then keep them over time and space. So for instance, you know, if you, you can, if you produce something in your village, you can sell it and take money and then keep it and then use it whenever you need to. So in that case, the money is allowing you to store the value of what you created or what you produced. So that's money as a store of value. Others also indicate that money acts as a standard of deferred payment. So moving on, we are going to talk about monetary aggregate. Monetary aggregate simply tells us how the supply of money is measured. So the total supply of money in the system, how do we measure it? We use what you call monetary aggregates. Generally speaking, there are two main money, monetary aggregates are classified into two. There's what you call narrow money and broad money. Narrow money refers to the most liquid form of money. And here we have two categories. The paper currency that we hold, that is the cash and the coins that we hold, and then also monies in your checking account or demand deposits. So if you have a checking account, the money sitting there, we classify it as M1. And uh, if you have cash or coins that you are holding, note that it says currency and coins with the public. So the currency that the central bank, the Bank of Ghana has printed and is sitting in this vault is not called cash in the hands of the public. So it's not part of M1. Now, broad money is also called M2. Now, broad money includes narrow money, that is M1, but also includes other less secret forms of money. So for instance, we have savings account, and then time deposit account or fixed deposit account. So fixed deposit account are the accounts that you hold for a particular period. So if you have a 30-day fixed deposit account, it means that when you put the money in, you are not supposed to withdraw until after 30 days. If you try to withdraw before 30 days, you pay a penalty. So we call them fixed deposit account. Now, the items in the additional items in the M2, apart from M1, they are less liquid money because you know you lose they are not readily available for you to use so we call them m2 
In Ghana, we also introduced a third concept of broad money called M2+. Plus. M2 plus is M2 plus foreign currency deposit. Now, for monetary policy purposes, when central banks talk about money supply, they usually refer to broad money. So in the case of Ghana, it's going to be M2 plus. So refer to table 4.1 on page 17 of the Bank of Ghana's quarterly bulletin that we referred to earlier and you see the monetary aggregate for Ghana in this period. Okay, so now we've introduced the concept of money and if you looked at how aggregate money supply can be measured. The next concept that we are going to introduce is something called the demand for money. What is the demand for money? The demand for money refers to the demand for real money balances. That is our desire to hold the most liquid form of money other than other interest-bearing assets. You know, money is a very liquid asset, but money is not the only asset that we can hold. We can hold other less liquid assets that pays us interest. When we talk about the demand for money, we are talking about our desire, our demand, our desire to hold very liquid money rather than holding other interest bearing assets, and that's what we call the demand for money. Now, why do individuals hold money? Well, primarily there are two reasons why we demand money. We demand money because it allows us to buy goods and services, and that's what we call transactions demand for money. But we also demand for money because it's an asset, and the most desirable part, the most desirable characteristics of money as an asset is that it gives us the convenience of buying things. It is very liquid, so it's readily available to use. So we have the transactions demand for money, and then also the asset demand for money. Now, in some textbooks, you also hear speculative demand for money. That is, we hold money so that it will allow us to take advantage of uh, opportunities that will come our way. That is a speculative demand. In this in this session, we are putting together the asset demand and the, the speculative demand as one. So now, focusing a little bit more on the transactions demand. Now, we said that transactions demand refers to the amount of money we hold for the purposes of transactions, that is to make purchases of goods and services. Now, so, in the slides, we see there's an example. If you hold, if you earn 100 CDs every month, and so at the beginning of the month, you earn 100 CDs, and at the end of the month, you finish spending all the 100 CDs. Then we are going to say that your average money balances, that is your demand, average monthly money demand, is going to be 50 Ghana CDs. And that is simply by looking at the two periods. So amount you hold at the beginning, which is 100, plus the amount you hold at the end, which is zero, divided by two. That is the two periods. And that's what, how we get the 50. So that's how, we, uh, that's how we calculate the demand for money. So the transactions demand for money is the amount of money that we hold solely for purposes of making transactions. So what factors will determine how much money we want to hold for transactions? Well, there are several of them. So we mentioned that transactions demand for money refers to the amount of money we hold solely for the purposes of making transactions, buying goods and services. Now, what factors affect the transactions demand for money? One of them is the price level. Now, if the if all things be equal, if the price of the goods and services that we are buying increases, it means that we need to hold more money to be able to buy them. So the higher the price level, the higher the demand for money. Also, the income level is an important determinant of transactions demand for money. In general, the higher our incomes, the higher the amount of purchases we make and the higher the amount of money we need to hold to make those purchases. So the income level and the price level are very important determinants of the transactions demand for money. Now in terms of the asset demand for money, 
It talks about, that's said demand for money talks about the amount of money we hold for its uh, property as an asset. Now, you can think of this as portfolio choice between holding different type of assets. So money is a very liquid asset that doesn't pay any return. But in place of holding our wealth as money, we can hold other illiquid assets, other less liquid assets that pay as interest. So in this case, the interest that we can earn on the other assets represents the opportunity cost of holding money. So if the interest rate goes up, the amount of money we want to hold is going to fall. Because if you take a simple example, let's say that you can hold your wealth as money, that is as liquid money, or in a savings account. Now, when you hold the liquid money, it doesn't pay you any interest. But if you put your wealth as savings account, that pays you interest. So if the, amount, the interest rate that is paid on your savings account increases, it increases the opportunity cost of holding money. And therefore, you hold less money. So the interest rate is the most important determinant of the asset demand for money. So moving on, we are going to talk briefly about the financial system. The financial system form, serves as the link between the economic agents within the economy. It's, it's mainly made up of financial intermediaries and financial markets. So what are financial markets? Financial markets are the markets where financial instruments are traded. And these include the stock market, the bond market, the foreign exchange market, all those are financial markets or the interbank market, they are all financial markets because financial instruments are traded there. Now, financial intermediaries, on the other hand, are the institutions that take, mobilizes from the surplus unit and then lend on to the deficit unit. So if you talk about institutions like banks or savings and loans institutions, what they do is that they mobilize savings for those who have Excess, and then they lend it on to others who need them. So those are the financial intermediaries. So the most popular ones are obviously the banks. But the commercial banks or the universal banks, as we call them in Ghana, are not the only, are not the only financial intermediaries. The others like mutual funds, mortgage buyers, derivative firms, and so on, they are all financial intermediaries. So what role do the financial system play? Well, we can think of at least four major roles. One of them is to mobilize and allocate resources. That is, the financial system collects savings from those who have, and then they're able to allocate it to those who need them. So they will take your savings, and then they will lend it on to somebody else who need it. They also help the economy manage its risk. So when you go to a bank for a loan, you see that a loan officer will assess the merit of your application and decide whether they're going, the bank will give you a loan or not. In that way, the financial system is helping us to assess the risk. So if they think that your investment project is too risky, they might decide not to finance it. They also serve as clearing houses. So a typical example, if you issue a check, or if somebody issues a check, you go and deposit it in your account. But you know there has to be a reconciliation between your bank and their bank to decide you know, before whether you have the sufficient funds before it's paid you. So in that sense, the bank, the financial system serves as clearing house. Finally, the financial system also transfer, help us transfer resources. So these days you can do even online transfer, transfer resources from one bank to the other, or you can even do the mobile money and then you can get it through the bank. So all the all of these are major roles that the financial system plays. Our last topic for this session is to look at what you call fractional reserve banking. And this is a very brief introduction to the concept of fractional reserve banking. Now, generally, in general, we say that commercial banks do not print money, but they create money. So what does it mean to say that commercial banks create money? And that is what this session is devoted to. By law, it is only the central bank that can print money. 
but we said that commercial banks create money. So in this session, we are going to look at the money creation role of commercial banks. So this session is mainly about the role of commercial banks. Now, we are going to start by looking at the balance sheet of commercial banks. How do a balance sheet of commercial banks look? Now, just as a caveat, I know that this is a very simplified version of the commercial bank balance sheet. Actual commercial bank balance sheets are very complicated, but this is just a simplified version. As you may have learned from your other uh, financial, from your other classes, the balance sheet is made up of two sides. There's the asset side and then there's the liability side. In the case of a commercial bank, the asset side include things like cash that they may have in their vaults, their loans, their securities, and then other the reserves that they may hold with the central bank or even the investment that they may have made. On the liability side, we mostly have the deposits that they've received from their clients. So whether it's savings deposit or demand deposit or time deposit. So this, this gives us a simplified example. As we can see the left hand side, the left panel is the asset side and the right panel is the liability side. The main thing is that the, the sum of the items on the liability side should be equal to the sum of the items on the asset side. So in this case, the assets have 200 reserves plus 800 loans and investment. That makes up 1,000. The total liabilities is also a, dep a total deposit of 1,000. So to understand the concept of deposit creation, let's consider a case where initially there was no bank and then a first bank opens. And this first bank is called, we are going to call it Bank One. So when Bank One opens, it gets its first client. And its first client walks into the bank and deposits a check of 100 Ghana CDs. Now, we, throughout, we are going to assume that the required reserve ratio is 10%. Now, what is the required reserve ratio? The required reserve ratio is the ratio, is a fraction of banks deposit, commercial bank deposit that are required by law, that they are required by law to keep as reserves. So that's what we call the required reserve ratio. The fraction is a fraction of all deposits that the banks are required, the commercial banks are required to keep with the central bank as reserves. So in this case, we say the required reserve ratio is 10%. It means that whenever they receive a deposit of 10 CDs, they have to keep one CD as reserve. So in this economy, if, when the first client comes and deposits uh, 100 CDs, it means that the required reserve is 10 CDs, and then the excess reserve is 90 CDs. Now, it is this excess reserve that the bank can make a loan from. So assuming that this bank decides to make a loan to a second client by issuing a check for 90 Ghana cities. So the, this client who received the, the loan deposits the check of 90 Ghana cities into another bank, that is a second bank. Now, when the second bank also received the 90 Ghana CD deposit, it is required by law to keep 10%, that is nine CDs, as reserves. And then the remaining 81 CDs is the excess reserves that it can make loans out of. So we are also going to assume that this bank will make the full amount of loans it can make, that is the 81 CDs, and it does so by issuing a check to another client. And then we are also going to assume that this client will deposit it in another bank. So at the moment, we have three clients and then we have three banks. So if you look at the balance sheet of the first two banks, first, if you look at bank one, initially received a deposit of 100 and it was required to keep uh, reserves of 10 CDs. 
And then the excess reserve that he could make loans out of was 90. And he made a full loans of 90. So you realize that bank one balance sheet balances as required. For bank two, he received a check of 90 CDs. And it was required to keep 9 CDs. And he made a total loans of 81 CDs. Now, if we allow this process to continue, then we can show that up to us at this point, you know, up to this third bank, when this third bank receives the 81 CDs deposit, it is required to keep eight CDs 10 pesos as reserves, and then it can make loans out of the remaining 72 CDs and 90 pesos. Now, up to this point, if you stopped at this point, you realize that the total amount of deposits that have been created from the 100 that was initially deposited is 90, is the 90 plus the 81 plus the 72.9. That is 343, 243 CDs, 90 pesos. Now, if you allow this process to continue, that is the process where the banks keep their required reserves and make the full amount of loans out of the remaining the excess reserves. You notice that by the time this process plays out, you notice that the total amount of additional deposit that will be created is going to be 900. So you can try it out on your own. So just keep the process rolling, assuming that there's a new client that received the total loan and deposits into a different, a different bank and keep the process rolling. You realize that by the time all this process plays out, the total amount of new loan that would have been created would be 900. In other words, the total amount of deposits in the system would be 1,000 and the that is the additional 900 created plus the initial 100 that was received. This leads us to the concept of a money multiplier. The money supply multiplier. The money multiplier simply measures the ratio of change in money created divided by the ratio of reserves. And it is also one over the required reserve ratio. So in the example that we just saw where the required reserve ratio was 10% or 0.1, we realized that the money multiplier was 10. Now, this process of deposit creation, remember that the process of creating loans, when the bank creates a loan, is creating a demand deposit. And we already explained that demand deposit is part of money. So even though the bank didn't print money, it created money simply by making, a, making loans. So when we say commercial banks don't print money, but they create money, we're simply talking about the fact that they create additional demand deposits, which is also money. In the example that we've just seen, we made a number of simplifying assumptions that are not practical. For instance, we assume that all money was kept in the banking system. But in the real world, we know that some money is a lot of monies are not kept in the banking system. We know some people, for instance, keep some monies under their pillows, and some people decide to hold cash. Obviously, the amount of cash, when you hold your cash, you are preventing the commercial banks from making loans out of that. So if we relax this assumption and allow the public to hold some cash, it's going to reduce the total amount of deposits that the banks can create. We also assume that banks make the full amount of loans they can make out of the excess reserves. That is, the banks do not keep excess reserves. In the real world, we realize that some banks keep excess reserves. They keep more reserves than they are required to do by law. So if they decide to keep excess reserves, that's also going to reduce the total amount of loans. So this is going to wrap up our session for today. And here are the main references for today's session. So we have the Samuelson and Nauthaus book, the 19th edition. All the books, the textbooks that are listed for this course have useful references for this particular section. 
Thank you, and I'll see you in the next session.